Welcome, everyone, um, to our first virtual uh, Learn, Discover, Grow event of the two, uh, 2022 new year. My name is Patrick Burnham. For those of you who are new, I'm the Educational Programs Coordinator um, for the Herring Gut Coastal Science Center. Sounds really good saying that because we just did a lot of really great work today and uh, we are updating our name which is really exciting. So you all are the first people who are hearing our really fun, new and exciting um, name, the Herring Gut Coastal Science Center. We're really excited about it. Um, anyway, tonight I am joined um, by my coworkers, Elena Zahowski and uh, Kirian Gwinnell, our educators, um, Tom Mullen, our executive director, and Sally Cruzan, our coordinator of development and marketing couple more things um, while we begin here. Because um, our time this evening is spent talking about the amazing natural resources that Maine has to offer, I want to begin our time together with an, an, an acknowledgement honoring all Indigenous people. We wish to acknowledge the spiritual and physical connection that the Abenaki and Wabanaki people have maintained to the Aki land and the Nibi water. Herring Gut Coastal Science Center and our work exists within this Aki, which is land, in Nebi, which is water, of this unceded territory of the Wabanaki homeland. It is our responsibility to foster relationships and opportunities that strengthen the well being of the indigenous people who carry forward the traditions of their ancestors. Now, we love to start our um, virtual events in a collaborative way. That's why we choose to do our events in this style of Zoom, where everyone can be a part. Um, because of this, we ask that everyone make sure that their mute is on to reduce uh, uh, competing voices and noises. At the end of the presentation, we'll have some time to ask questions. Uh, and you can either type those questions in, in as we go, or uh, at the end, you can unmute yourself and ask any questions. And before I introduce our guest speaker tonight, uh, I do want to note that Herring Gut Coastal Science Center is a nonprofit organization that is supported by donations and gifts from the public. Through your generosity, we're able to provide programs like this one tonight um, and some of the other amazing programs uh, that you'll be seeing in the future. If you'd like the event tonight and you have the means, we would greatly appreciate your support. You can find the donation link on our website and it will also be in the chat tonight um, and with a follow-up email. So I am now happy to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, her name is Chelsea Lathrop. Uh, Chelsea is the Education and Outreach Coordinator um, for the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Um, a little bit of a silent applause for Chelsea to welcome her. Uh, Chelsea is a Maine native who grew up in Oxford Hills, where hunting, fishing, trapping, and agriculture were not just a hobby, but a way of life. Her passion and education led her to Unity College, where she graduated with a Bachelor of Science uh, degree in Conservation Law Enforcement and a concentration in Fisheries. In 2015, she was selected as one of the five female conservationists of the year by the Saf uh, Safari Club International. And after college, Chelsea spent some time working with animal husbandry in Florida and was an agriculture and aqua hydroponics educator in Las Vegas, Nevada, before moving back to Maine last year. Welcome back, Chelsea. Um, through her travels and experience, she has developed a passion for sharing her knowledge and skill sets with the community to get more people outdoors. So let's welcome Chelsea. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We're really excited to have you. And uh, I'm sure everyone here is excited to hear from you. Thank you for such a wonderful introduction, Patrick. Uh, I'm very excited to be here tonight. Bear with me as I share my presentation with you all. Let me know if you guys can see my presentation screen. It looks good for me. Perfect. Well, welcome and thank you all for joining us tonight. Throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, um, I did save time at the end for a question and answer session, like Patrick said, but if you have any questions along the way, feel free to put them in the chat and Patrick will be monitoring as we go. 
Um, and then if you don't think of anything during the presentation, I'll also provide my contact information so you guys can get a hold of me after the presentation as well. So, as Patrick said, my name is Chelsea. I am the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. And what does that mean? That means that I primarily focus on adult and youth education when it focuses around angling. So fishing, um, both ice fishing and open water fishing year round, I get to hang out and get paid to do fun things. I am a Maine native. I've been ice fishing my whole life. It is my biggest passion and I've worked with aquaculture and fisheries all throughout college and after college and now bringing me back to Maine to do what I love, which is teaching the public about our natural resources here in Maine. As Patrick said over this last six years I have done a lot of traveling. I've gathered a lot of experience with animal husbandry, teaching, and social media and marketing, and I did go to Unity. I have a degree in conservation law enforcement and my concentration in fisheries, so super excited to be able to be here tonight and share all of that with you all. So the overall mission of MDIFW or the Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife is that we wanna protect and conserve the animals and the wildlife uh, of our whole state. And that doesn't just include the animals, that means wildlife fisheries, but their habitat, their food, and the heritage of Maine outdoor recreation. And within Inland Fish and Wildlife, my role within the Information Education Division is the, the purpose and goal to educate the public. So not only do we want to teach you, we want to offer hands-on experiences too. So I do adult programming like the Becoming an Outdoor Woman program and our Sustain Me program, which focuses on um, hunter and gathering skills. And then we get to promote ice fishing and um, open water fishing events throughout the year. So I'm going to teach you a little bit about that. And why should we ice fish? Uh, I assume you're all here because you want to learn about it. Um, some of you are here to support me. So thank you, mom and my aunt. I see you in the audience. Um, but for most, winter is one of those seasons that you are either eagerly awaiting or thoroughly dreading. I used to be one of those folks that were dreading winter. But as a returning Mainer, I've gathered the notion that it's more of a misunderstood season. And when properly prepared for, there is plenty of fun to be had. And trust me, winter is not my favorite season. But ice fishing is one of my favorite ways to enjoy the season. And it is one of my favorite things to do throughout the year. Ice fishing dates back thousands of years to our indigenous ancestors here in Maine. Uh, that would be the Wabanaki people. And they began ice fishing as an adaption to those long cold winters with little food. And it's hard to believe that the beginning of ice fishing started with chopping holes in the ice. And how they did that by hand, I don't know. I recently tried hand augering ice fishing. Not fun, not fun to hand cut through a lot of ice. Um, today, that uh, fishing technique has evolved into using powered augers. You can use propane or gas, even the hand auger, even axes. Um, they have shacks, which, believe it, back in the day were these little lean-tos that they would build and they would lay on the ice and peer into the holes. Today, those ice shacks are big enough for a whole family, for a group of folks, they're heated. Some of them have bathrooms and stoves, and so much uh, has changed since ice fishing began. The one thing that has stayed the same is the tradition of being passed down from generation to generation. I learned how to ice fish from my dad and my grandparents and my uncle, and it was a family thing that we have done since as long as I can remember. And, you know, it's not the, the fishing that makes it fun. It's the experience of being with those friends and family and the conservation behind it for me. Every year, the biologists through the Inland Fish and Wildlife monitor the lakes and ponds, and it has become a conservation method for managing those species in those ponds. And so they're constantly monitoring to make sure that we're not over or under harvesting a certain body of water. 
Though we do want you to ice fish safely and responsibly, there are a few ways that you can do that when planning your ice fishing trip. Uh, the first thing to do is to make sure that you tell everyone where you're going. Uh, you don't have to tell them the specific location. We know fishermen get pretty uh, protective of their secret spots, but make sure that you let someone know when you're leaving and when you're coming back. Make sure to dress in layers. Maine is cold in the morning, warm in the afternoon, and, and gets cold again at around sunset. So make sure that you're keeping those thermal layers. And it's not a bad idea to bring extras with you in case you get wet. Be sure to check the weather when you go. Uh, make sure that there's no snowstorms, that there is enough ice. We are notorious for Mother Nature being warm one day and cold the next, and that ice is constantly freezing and thawing, and that can make for different types of ice. So you wanna make sure that you are prepared for that. You can find out more about our ice safety on our website. There's a nice blog that tells you all about how to read the ice. And then make sure that you're checking the law book. So for every body of water in Maine, there is different laws and regulations, and you wanna make sure that you know what laws apply to the body of water you're fishing. One thing that I will note is a very commonly asked question is when you're looking at your Maine law book, there's a few ways to get it. You can get it at your local town office, you can print it out online, or you can download it to your phone. But in the very first few pages, it gives you a whole bunch of definitions and then it starts talking about a north and south zone. So that is one of the most confusing things about the book. And that is just determining the north and southern regions of Maine and what kind of fish you will find in those regions. And we'll talk a little bit about that in our next slide. But I just wanted to mention that those zones have different general laws. So that's where you get started when you're looking at the law book. And then finally, before we move on, make sure that you practice carry in and carry out. We want to respect our landowners, both private and public. And so make sure whatever you take in, you bring out with you. So what species does Maine have? We're talking about ice fishing, how we can get out there, but what kind of fish live here? Well, we have two common categories of fish in Maine, and we often refer to them as the cold water species or warm water species. And what in the world does that mean? Well, our cold water species are our trout, our salmon, the Arctic char, cusk, and whitefish. Those commonly are our native species to Maine. And then we also have some warm water species. Now warm water species are, as the name suggests, they like warmer water. You can find them in more southern Maine. Again, back to that north and southern region, you're going to find a lot of our cold water species in the north zone, and a lot of the warm water species in the south zone. But that doesn't mean that you can't find some crossover here and there. That's why it's really important to check those specific water bodies for regulations on species and how to fish them. And just because they're warm water species, though, doesn't mean that they are not native to Maine. Uh, you might have heard of the term invasive species. We won't talk a lot about them, but they are species that are non-native to Maine. And those are things like our northern pike, the black crappie, the <clears throat> some versions of the sunfish. Um, but not all of them are invasive. So, for example, the pumpkin seed sunfish and the red-breasted sunfish are native. The chain pickerel is native, but the pike is not. So pike and pickerel are in that similar family, but they're not both native. Another scientific reason between the difference in cold water and warm water fish is that the cold water fish need deeper waters with more oxygen. So they need a lot more pristine water than those warm water species. We like to call the warm water species like those not picky eaters. They will literally eat anything. They will be found more in those dingier waters. They could probably live in a mud hole rather than our pristine uh, waters if they needed to. But you will find them throughout the state. And let's see here, make sure I hit all my notes. So there are some really good ways to talk about characteristics and how to ID them. On our website, we do have a species specific um, section. So you can go in there and see each individual species, learn about the habitat that they like, what do they eat, uh, where can you find them in the state? We also have another tool that I will link uh, after the presentation 
you'll all get a copy of my resource sheet that has all of these links in it. And during our question and answer, I can show you some of those fun spots as well. But it'll tell you everything you could possibly want to know about the fish, and they are ongoing. So we'll see more updated information on the website as we continue to update that. And if you have more information about specific species, we can talk about them, um, but I could go on forever. So I won't stay here forever. So let's talk about some ice fishing gear or some equipment that you might have. We talked about dressing for the winter season. You're gonna to wanna to make sure you have those layers. The bare essentials would be insulated boots, gloves, a hat, and some warm outer layers, a jacket, Make sure that you bring extras. I cannot emphasize that enough, especially gloves. I am notorious for dropping my gloves in the slush. So make sure you bring an extra pair or a waterproof pair. And then for ice fishing, I like to tell people that it can be as expensive or as basic as you want. You can go out there with an ax and a stick and line and you can do your ice fishing or you can get the ice fishing equipment that you typically would see out there. The traps, the bait buckets, the skimmers. It's entirely what your budget allows for. With a chisel or an auger, depends on what your budget or what your weight can carry. Some of those traditional gas or propane augers are really heavy. I'll admit they're heavy for myself, um, but you can get lighter models and I have seen a lot of new power, battery powered drills and augers as well. So you could use those. I can also answer any questions if you have specifics, but kind of like species ID, we could talk about gear all night. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on different types of augers unless you have specific questions. And then for traps and tackle, it's pretty basic. Um, we have different types of traps that you can find. There is the traditional um, perpendicular, we call them jack traps or heritage traps are local to Maine. If you're not from Maine, you might've heard of Fraybill or Claw. Um, those are some really popular ice fishing traps. They come in all different shapes, sizes, they also have contraptions, uh, kind of like this little guy here in the upper right hand side of your screen. And that is just going to turn your jig rod into an ice fishing uh, trap. Essentially, you would get your small fishing pole and you could set it up there. In the probably 50s and 60s, folks before they were really coming out with ice fish fishing traps, we're using their fishing poles from open season and just hanging them over the edge of holes. So they didn't even have ice traps. They were just using their typical poles. And then somebody had the brilliant idea of cutting those poles in half. And so you have much smaller jig rods. And when we get to the question and answer, I also have some examples of these things I can show you as well. Some additional equipment that, again, once you become a seasoned pro or if you really want to go all out your first year, help make ice fishing a lot simpler. A sled, whether it be a kid's sled, a toboggan, or specific ice fishing uh, sleds, you can carry all your gear out. Trust me, it's a lifesaver. Regardless of what you get, a sled is probably your best investment. And you're going to want a bait bucket and net. I personally like to have something that is insulated. I have a five gallon bucket with one of the styrofoam coolers on the inside. You could also get the smaller buckets that are insulated. Fraybill makes a really nice one. And a net. So, you know, one of those things that is commonly overlooked is the net. So folks will be in there reaching the fish out with their bare hands, which is totally easy to do, totally okay. But your hands get cold and I am, not very kind when I get cold. So a net is my best friend. You're also gonna want an ice scoop or skimmer to get the floating chunks out of your hole after you ax through it, chop through, or use an auger. A pack basket or a large backpack keeps all of your equipment nice and organized. The creepers or ice cleats keep you safe. Fishing pliers and forceps for getting the hooks out. Depth sounders are a little metal uh, ball and they hook to the end of your hook and that's how you can find the depth of the water based on your line and then that allows you to determine how far under the ice or up off the bottom you want to fish. I highly recommend hand and foot warmers. 
ice safety picks in case you fall through and you can pull yourself back up onto safe ice. Chisel to check ice thickness or to chisel through those holes. Don't forget food. That's my first thing I pack and sunglasses and sunscreen. One of the biggest uh, things that people forget is that you can get sunburn and definitely windburn while you're out there ice fishing. So make sure that you bring those sunglasses, even a face mask and your sunscreen. And no matter where you are in Maine, there are so many opportunities for fishing. With over 6,000 lakes and ponds in Maine, and I believe we have thousands of miles of, of rivers, there's tons of places where you could go fishing, probably right in your backyard. Uh, for getting started, I would recommend targeting those warm water species like perch, pickerel, and bass. And the reason I say that is, one, they're definitely more prevalent in the southern part of the state. They are most prevalent at lakes that are accessible, and also they're really easy to catch. Uh, they are not used to the cold weather and the cold water, so they're more eager to eat your bait when you're out there fishing, so you're going to have a lot more luck. Uh, they also have liberal, more liberal regulations. So for example, on bass and perch, you're probably not going to have what we call a bag limit or a length and quantity limit to how many you can have. So you can also sign up to receive our updates from the department. Those will include monthly fishing reports. You can see our stocking report. I'll show you how to find that on our website as well. Um, and those are really fun things to see where the fish are going from our hatcheries. Because not only do we have our native populations and our wild breeding um, species, but we also stock uh, hundreds of thousands of fish every year into our waters, which is really awesome. So there are also some a couple really fun tools that you can use to locate water bodies. So if you're really struggling on where to go fishing or what fish are going to be found in that, we have two different tools, the main fishing guide, Google Earth layer, which will show you um, through Google Earth or you can go to our fishing laws online angling tool. And that's actually a tool that was developed by our fisheries staff here at the department. And they have created all the laws and regulations. So when you look up a pond, it tells you all of the fun facts that you need in one place so you're ready to go. And you can actually download that second option to your phone. So as long as you have cell phone service or data out in the field, you can access that right through the it's a, a link, not an app, a link on your phone that you can download like an app. There's directions on the website because I needed them. And lastly, we always recommend a local bait and tackle shop. Nobody knows best than the locals. And in Maine, ice fishing is a tradition, a way of life. Some people live for ice fishing through the winter months. And we recommend going to talk to the staff. They are always willing to talk to you. And they're not just willing to sell you their products, but they're telling you what works best because they're not going to sell it if it's not um, going to sell off the shelves in their local bait shops. So definitely recommend going and talking to the locals. So what are some next steps that you can do? Well, you can review Maine's open water and ice fishing laws. That law book again is um, accessible online. You can go to your town office. You can check out our ice fishing guide for beginners. I have that linked and we'll go through there in just a second. Don't forget to buy your fishing license in the state of Maine. Anyone over the age of 16 does need a fishing license and you can do that all online or you can come visit us here in Augusta or at your town office. Um, find a mentor. You can contact any of your local fishing game clubs or contact me. Um, my email and phone number will be at the end of this presentation. It'll also be in the resource list and please don't hesitate to reach out. I love to talk fishing and I could probably talk your ear off. So feel free to use me as a resource. Now the state of Maine does a really cool thing in February and in June where they offer a free fishing weekend. So if you're just getting started in ice fishing and you're not really sure that you wanna get into it, you're not sure what it's all about, you can try out fishing on free fishing weekend, which is going to be February 19th, 20th and the 21st this year. That's uh, President's Day weekend in February. 
and you can go to any place in the state of Maine and fish on those days, which is a pretty fantastic opportunity. And you can attend a fishing derby. So even if you don't know anything about fishing, you don't want to fish, but you kind of want to know what that culture is like, there are a ton of fishing derbies across the state and they're linked on our website. So if you're ever curious, you can Google it, you can look on our website, or you can contact me and I probably know where there's a derby for you to go to. You could always hire a registered Maine guide. We have that on our website as well, where you can find a Maine guide. They love taking people out or attend an ice fishing clinic. So if none of the above works for you, come and see me on February 26th. I'll be hosting an ice fishing <laughs> clinic in Norway, Maine. Uh, it's gonna be on Norway Lake. Where we'll be fishing for those warm water species. There are trout in there, but I'm targeting those bass and pickerel. They get really big out there in the bog. And I will be there from nine to three and you can join me. It's completely free. You just have to bring your fishing license. So I hope you guys have fun, be safe, and enjoy the Maine Outdoors responsibly. At this time, if anybody has questions, uh, I would love to walk through some of those resources with you or answer any specific mm. questions you may have. So yeah, I, I'm a listener. I'm Patrick's dad, actually, <laughs> and have been fishing for years ice fishing for years and in open water for years but the the book is really hard to understand i mean there's so many regulations in the state that you know if i was to come in from out of state i wouldn't know where to begin i mean some lakes have have you know two trap limits uh you can only catch uh, salmon at this time of year, you can only take two salmon and two trout and it's very confusing to me and I've been doing it for a long time. So, you know, I just go out and, and catch a couple of fish and say, that's it for me, not knowing the limits. It's, it's, it's really confusing. Sorry, Pat. No, I do not disagree with you. I agree. That is very confusing. And uh, don't tell my boss, but I have not read this cover to cover, okay? I, am I haven't well, either. <laughs> yeah, the float tool that we designed, um, there's a link that I will include, and then you guys will all get a follow-up email with those resources. But if you let me show my screen here one more time, I will show you what we have for a float tool, which is a really fantastic tool. Let me see where it is. So first of all, let me start by saying that on the Inland Fish and Wildlife page, can you guys all see this? Yep. Perfect. So where to go? I put it up there and then it went away. So over here in our uh, website, we have a specific portion for fishing in Maine. And this is where all of our fishing resources are. Everything you could possibly want to know about fishing, it is here I promise you it might be lost in the sauce, but it is here and we are working on updating it. So keep checking back. Um, that is one of my goals is to help reform the fishing portion of our website. And underneath here, we have know the laws. So you can go under and search the fishing laws. That's searching by your specific water body, or you can use our float tool. So these are those instructions that I told you if you wanted to download it to your phone. Um, but you can hit this launch the main fishing tool from any Internet Explorer, Google Chrome, um, and, and it'll pop right up for you. Once you're in this float tool, it's kind of like using Google Maps or a, a digital map of sorts, and you can type in any water body in Maine. So, for example, and it also gives you a tour. So if you would like the tour. Um, we're going to skip it for all intensive purposes. And I love fishing Norway Lake. So I'm going to type in Norway Lake and it is going to bring it up and tell me that it's actually called Penasawasi Lake. And in that area, it tells you the inlets and outlets. And when you click in, it'll actually bring you to the specific portion and tell you all of the fishing laws. So right now it is in the south zone. It is a general fishing law 
So you can go to the front of that book, skip everything else and read general fishing laws. And then it says, except from October 1st to December 31st is artificial lures only. So it's giving you the specific breakdown for that specific water body and you don't have to go through the booklet. So I personally think this is a much easier um, tool to use than the booklet. The only problem is you are better off using it before you go fishing rather than when you get there, unless you have really good cell service. Perfect. Thank and you. That's, and that's definitely, so, dad, I can help you navigate that. <laughs> all the rules. So we'll work on that. I promise. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Perfect. Um, so, so we have a question, um, in the, the chat from Chris, um, he says, uh, typically, when you set up after drilling your hole, how long would you normally be sitting to catch a fish? And how long does an ice fishing outing last with setup and breakdown? Is it a four to six hour adventure? That is a fantastic question. And the answer is, I don't have an exact answer for you. Every fishing trip is completely different. Uh, it really depends on where you're going, what your goals are, and what equipment you have. I'll give you a recent example of I decided I was going to go fishing in my backyard. Uh, my mom can attest to this. She's on here somewhere. Uh, I was going to go. I left the house at two o'clock and I said, I have until sundown at four. I will be fine. I got there with my hand auger and did not think about the fact that there was 14 inches of ice. So I drilled my hole and it took me a whole hour because I am not that strong. Uh, and it took me a whole hour to drill one hole. And I fished that one hole for about an hour and I caught nothing. And the reason for that is my placement. I was way too close to shore um, and it was late in the day. I probably would have had much better luck if I went early in the morning. So uh, all said and done, I was out there for about two, two and a half hours with nothing. Now, if I had a power auger, for example, a couple of weeks ago, I went out. We went to a pond that was recently stocked with trout set up, I believe, six holes, less than six holes. Within the first half an hour of getting on the ice, we had already caught a pickerel. That is a warm water species that's eager to eat. And then within about an hour, we had a, a good brood stock, that's a, a breeding trout, through the ice. It was huge. Definitely one that they had just stocked. Um, and so that fishing trip was equally the same length. I think we were there for three hours in total, and we caught three different fish. So it really depends on the day. It depends on where you're at, what you're looking for. So many different factors. It can also, um, Chelsea, as I tag onto this, um, and being vicariously um, uh, uh, an angler in the wintertime through my father, um, you know, it also depends upon, like you had said, the placement of where your hole is. Are you too shallow? Um, is there... You know, sometimes I remember going out and putting an auger in and you just get mud because you're, you know, too close to the shore or maybe you're just far enough away from the shore and you have just a couple of inches below, you know, the ice line and only a certain species of fish are going to be even in that area. So if you go out a little bit deeper, you might have better chance, but then it's also where are you going to set your lure? You know, if, you know, my brother-in-law is going and really wants his game species of you know, landlocked salmon or some bigger trout, like you had mentioned, deeper, colder water, he might put that line into that deeper, colder water. And he'd be happy sitting there for six hours, waiting for just one potential chance of getting this one potential fish, because mm -hmm. he doesn't want you know, anything to do with the sunfish or the pike or whatever it is that are in a different location. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point, Patrick. It really depends on what you're looking for, for a species as well. Um, I know that Arctic char is a main specific uh, species that people come from across the country to fish. I had never heard of an Arctic char and we've never been fishing for an Arctic char because they're only in 
a handful of northern lakes and they're very hard to catch. So that for me as a kid when I was going fishing was never beneficial. Now as an adult and I want to hit my checkoff list, I will probably go and I would sit all day waiting for that one fish, even if I caught nothing else. So um, I recommend that if you want a quick fishing trip and you're just getting into it, go for those warmer water species, the ones that you hear a lot about. Um, the bass, the, the sunfish, pickerel, perch, you can go for brook trout are even a little bit easier than something like a, a brown trout or a landlocked salmon or even a togue. So I got another quick question, Chels. Sure. Um, how can you, how can we, we went fishing over the weekend. We caught a couple of brook trout on a lake in Washington. How can you determine if it's a if it's a native trout or a stocked trout that is a fantastic question um so there's a couple of tells but not to the average fisherman or angler i would say so i to my knowledge there is no restriction saying that you can keep a wild caught versus a stocked trout. If there's trout in there and you're allowed to catch them, you can keep whatever you catch as long as it's within the length and quantity right. amount. Um, right. But to go into detail about that, um, the hatcheries usually clip the fins. Uh, it does not hurt the fish at all. It is um, just a standard procedure when they release them so that we know what year they were introduced to that body of water and so that when we do our trap netting or our creel surveys, which is how we get our, our data on the fish, then we will know that that is a stocked or native. So sometimes if you if you catch a fish and you will notice that there's like a clip literally taken out of their fin, it's usually either their um, their anal fins or the, the dorsal fin. Okay, yeah. nice. That's very cool. I actually didn't know that. That's awesome. Yeah. A good question. I love opening it up because I never know what I'm going to get for a question. And, you know, uh, I've been trying to catch a rainbow trout for I don't know how many years now. And I cannot catch a rainbow trout. I, I don't know if I'm not fishing the right waters or what, but it's hmm. very difficult for rainbows. I brown. It is. It I've is caught difficult. brown and I've caught you know, just regular brooks, but never a rainbow uh, and, and ice fishing. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're a hard species to catch ice fishing. Um, that's for sure. I honestly don't have any recommendations on that one. I can look some up for you or talk to the experts. I have done, you know, it's funny from all the anglers that I talk to, there's usually a species in particular that everybody is used to catching. And so when someone says, well, that's a, a difficult species for me. Uh, it wasn't a difficult species for me, but it, it varies from person to person. For example, I grew up catching brown trout and brook trout, but um, my boss has never caught a brown trout through the ice. And mm. so it's just funny how that works sometimes. Email me if you want to know about rainbows. I'll help you. I will. <laughs> I got to catch one. Wonderful. Any other questions? I have one, but I want to um, continue to open it up for anyone else. Um, all right. Maybe this one will spark one. Um, we did a, a lot of talking about our lakes and rivers or um, lakes and ponds for, you know, ice fishing. But one that I feel like sometimes people glean over and is one when I would like bring up to people when I have traveled elsewhere is when I talk about smelting on a tidal river. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could just uh, to talk about smelting for a little bit. I know I grew up right in Gardner and there was a bunch of smelting camps right there. And it was always like, I explain it to anyone and they're like, what did you do for six hours <laughs> during a high tide? Like, are you kidding? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so yeah. So smelting is another form of ice fishing. Uh, it is done on the Kennebec River, typically anywhere from Gardner um, up through. It's kind of a short, relatively short distance on the Kennebec considering how long it is. It is a difficult area to fish because of the tide. So we have to be 
cautious of the incoming and outgoing tides. The ice does move up and down with the river. And it is in those six hour time intervals. So you basically go to a camp. Uh, they put out anywhere between 10 and 30 different ice shacks on, on the river. And then you rent the shack anywhere from a two man shack to a 10 person or 12 person shack. And you are there for six hours on the tide and you're trying to catch these little fish. And I will show you what a smelt looks like. So if you are unfamiliar with smelts, See if I can move this little bar. Maybe not. We'll just move my tabs around until we get where I'm looking for. There we go, under species. So this is another really great resource on our website. Underneath our fish and wildlife tab up here, there's a bunch of really cool nav navigating tabs. Um, underneath fisheries, we have the species information. So all those species we talked about are broken down into their categories. And then you can learn more about how to ID them, what they eat, where you'll find them in the state. So uh, rainbow trout are on here and there are some fun facts in there on how to catch them. But for our smelts, I know I saw them on here somewhere, rainbow smelts. They look like this little guy and they can be anywhere from your index finger in length all the way out to, I've caught them 12 inches long before. They can get really big. That's a big smelt, um, but they run in the cold weather um, and you wanna catch them with what we call a treble hook or you can jig for them. Uh, in the shacks, they typically have a wooden dowel across the top with some clear monofilament line wrapped around and a hook. And then you drop the hook with either night crawlers or um, I think they use blood worms as well down into the hole and you put them at various depths in the water and you're trying to snag those fish as they come schooling through. So they'll be coming in, in big schools and groups of fish and you're just snagging them and you're allowed to catch an entire five gallon bucket full uh, for your group. So it's, it's pretty cool. There's a lot of them. And this is a winter activity on the Kennebec, but you can also do smelting on freshwater lakes. There are freshwater smelts as well, um, not just the saltwater smelts. They are two different species, but you can catch them in the um, freshwater lakes. That's what I grew up doing was in a shack and you sit in all hours of the night pulling up smelts, much more successful on the Kennebec than you are on lakes and ponds as our smelt species are on the decline in Maine. But that is what we are here for to help restore those. And that's why the laws and regulations are always changing as well. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it was great. I, I, I used to love going out and smelting Boy Scouts, this and that, doing things. Um, it was a fun, fun, unique pastime. <laughs> it is very fun and very unique. And there is a culture associated with smelting as well. Um, most folks will pack their dinner. You can cook it on the stove. There's other um, adult activities that are partaken in the shacks as well. Lots of drinking, lots yeah. of people watching. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, again, open up for anyone else out there in the world. I did think of another fun one I could ask. Um, how in the world, Chelsea, do these fish species survive temperatures cold enough to freeze? Mm, that is a fantastic question. So our lakes and streams have to be able uh, to at least have a pocket of that cold water or a pocket of warm water for these species to survive the winter in. So if you have noticed any of the private ponds or local ponds that are stocked in your backyard, I grew up with a friend who used to stock his, his pond in his backyard, your ponds have to be a minimum depth. So there's actually regulations in place that make sure that any pond that is stocked with a fishery is a certain water level so that these fish have a place to escape 
when the ice freezes. So okay. you won't find a body of water that is stocked or has a native species in it that is going to completely freeze solid. Now, on occasion that that does happen, uh, it hasn't happened in a very long time to my knowledge, um, those fish can't survive. But they will often find the lowest point as close to the bottom as they can and kind of slow their heart rate and go into not dormancy, but almost a, a dormant-like state so that they can ride out the winter time. They can go the entire winter without eating. It's not their ideal situation, but for these warm water species that are not used to the cold, uh, the cold water species are thriving. It's opposite in the summertime. So these cold water species that we have, as the waters in Maine are warming, they're not accustomed to the warmer waters in the summertime. So they're finding that pocket of really cold water and hunkering down in the summertime. And it's the opposite in the winter for those warm water species. Oh, very cool. Yeah. And those inlets and outlets are super important as well. Those help produce the water flow and aeration to the ponds. And there is that natural um, methane and gas system that helps aerate the lakes and streams and ponds as well. So it's a really fascinating scientific side of the habitat. If you guys are interested, I can give you a lot more information on that. That's great. Yeah. Um, freshwater ecosystems, especially in Maine, are, are so unique, you know, needing the oxygen, but being sealed off from it from yeah. the whole, you know, for a couple of months because of ice is so unique. And you know, we think that, oh, well, then that would be great if there isn't as much snow or ice cover for these species because there's more light and more oxygen, all these things. And there's that striking balance between we want the ice, we, we don't want, you know, like, so it's, um, it's very yeah. cool. It's, uh, it's and fun in a to sense, talk about. ice fishermen help with that situation because we're going out there on the ice and we're drilling holes, which are adding airflow and we're moving the species around. And so if anybody has been out on the ice, I learned this fun fact that I think it's really cool. Um, if you hear those really loud booms and cracks in the ice, it's not always a bad thing. Um, sometimes those booms and cracks are caused by the movement of fish beneath the surface. So if you envision a school of fish and they're moving rapidly, they're moving that water and it's gonna be warmer towards the surface than on the bottom, that water pressure is gonna change underneath the ice and there's nowhere for it to go. So it's gonna move the ice and make those um, cracks and those loud noises. So not necessarily a sign of unsafe ice, just a, a presence of fish beneath. It's very cool. So one other quick question. Um, we can use worms in, in most of the ice water fishing venues. I mean, mm -hmm. okay. So it, it, it doesn't have to be live debate. It could be, it can be worms. Yes, that is a fantastic point that I have not mentioned throughout this presentation is how do you bait your fish? So um, when you're fishing, we're used to using those worms in the summertime or lures. Um, they can be rubber or metal or what we call spoons. Um, and you can still use those in the winter time. But again, it goes into what you are allowed to use for each pond. So using that float tool, using the lob up to determine is something artificial lure only, which means that you can only use a metal or rubber lure, or can you use uh, the restriction of dead bait only. That means that you can take a shiner or a, a minnow. Let me pull up a page for you guys so you can see what options you have for bait. So under that species information tab, there is a bait fish tab. This tells you all about different bait fish in Maine, um, the uh, regulations and laws behind it, why we have those. Uh, and this is because we were having tons of unregulated bait fish in the state that were being introduced to lakes and, and ponds. And then it was destroying our native flora and fauna that are in there, our native species. So now we only have uh, common legal bait fish 
and you want to make sure that you're only using those. And if it says dead bait only, you can use those species, but it has to be dead before arrival. And uh, we're going to be publishing a blog post in the next week or two that talks about tips for fishing with dead bait. And what we recommend, and as crazy as it sounds, is you go to your bait shop and you're either going to be fishing a live bait spot. So you say, hey, I want a dozen shiners and you have your bucket of live bait. Or if you're fishing a place that says dead bait only, you say, I want a dozen shiners, but put them in a plastic bag, no water. And we take them and uh, it is the most humane way that we can take our bait fish to the next pond and not introduce those species to a place where they're not supposed to be, but yet they're still fresh enough for you to use and catch those fish. So a new alternative uh, that we're, we're starting to promote to help with the invasive situation. That's fascinating. Yeah, I never knew. And people use wax worms and mealworms and they use um, maggots for fishing. Not my cup of tea, but it is options for ice fishing that I never thought about. It's wonderful. All right, we're almost to our end. Does anyone have any last minute questions for Chelsea or myself? Okay, well, um, before everyone dismisses here, uh, we wanna say thank you to Chelsea for taking time out tonight to uh, be with us. We very much appreciate you coming in and presenting with us. Um, we'd love to do more things with you in the future and you know, thank you for your knowledge and expertise. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight to our first uh, Learn, Discover virtual, uh, Learn, Discover, Grow virtual event of the year. Uh, we uh, at Herring Gut uh, Coastal Science Center are, are doing these virtual events the last Tuesday of every month um, throughout the year. Uh, and um, so look forward to any new or, or coming out with any of our our scheduling of events that are coming up um, shortly here. And in just a minute, uh, Sally actually just now put our link to our donation page. Like I said, if you have the means and you enjoy tonight's presentation, we uh, greatly appreciate any type of gifts or donations that you can give. We are a nonprofit. We exist to um, give these programs, um, but only with your support. And with that, uh, thank you all so much uh, for being here, and we hope that you have an amazing night. Thank you, everyone, again so for coming much. in. Thank have you all. Night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chelsea. That was awesome. You're welcome. Thank